So welcome back. We're so happy to have you back in here. Thank you for the photo. This is the first time we've had to do it in the auditorium. So you can thank the weather, but that was fun. So we have a couple of great um, two scientists with us today and one science illustrator. And we're going to spend a few minutes just hearing um, who they are, a little bit about their journey. So joining us today, we have James, Carl, and Amy. And I'm going to turn it over to each of them to introduce themselves a little bit more. But we thought it would be fun. I wanted to hear from them. What did you want to be when you were 17? And I can start with mine. Mine was an astronaut, so you can tell I got very close to that. Um, so James, I'll turn it over to you first if you want to share what did you want to be with your 17 and a little bit more about yourself. Um, so uh, my name's James. My friends call me Jimmy, so you're very welcome to call me Jimmy. Um, I'm from uh, England, so I'm from near, I've always got my slides behind me. I'm from near Stonehenge, so I went on a couple picnics there once or twice when I was younger. Um, when I was 17, I wanted to be an accountant. Um, I had a mug that had like a little like inscription on it saying like, world's best accountant. Um, I really enjoyed maths, uh, I was kind of a weird uh, <laughs> teenager. Um, but in the end, I basically ended up going down the biology route um, because teachers um, was much more interested in history, biology, and those were the subjects I ended up choosing and um, ended up where I am now. So yeah. All right, hi everyone, I'm Amy, and um, I'm the science illustrator here at Salk, and I am from San Diego. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I went to La Jolla High School. Um, my favorite activities are drawing, which is how I got into my job, and also taking care of my succulents. Um, so when I was 17, I have three answers to this question. The first honest answer is, I don't know. I really had no idea what I wanted to do at 17. Second answer was, I thought I would like go into healthcare probably because I was, science was my best subject. So, you know, seems like a, that's the career path to go. And the third answer is, I mean, in my dreams, I wanted to be a manga artist. But um, here I am now. And so my background, I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad, majored in biology, took two years off to teach English in Japan. And so that's something I'm really um, passionate about, like, you know, telling people, like, you, you can take little side roads, you know, in your, in your career journey. Um, two years after undergrad to teach English in Japan, and then two years at a master's program in Toronto specializing in medical and scientific illustration. And now I'm here at Salk. Thank you. Great. Thank you for introducing yourselves. So I have a couple of questions to get things started. And then we will have the option to submit via Mentimeter, or Shoshana will be running around with a microphone. So think about your questions while we go ahead and get started. So the first one I have is, what does a day in your life look like with your job? And I'll go ahead and start with you, James, if you don't mind telling us about a day in your life. Yeah, um, definitely. So um, I'm a plant biologist. I study um, plant genetics. So my day often starts with me coming in and going to the greenhouse, the growth chambers, and checking on my plants, seeing how they're doing, 
have they had a good day, a good night? Um, generally, um, they're not looking very happy and I have to give them some water or uh, <laughs> do some pruning. Um, so I'll go there, make sure that all of my experiments are set up. So I have to grow plants for my experiments. So there's quite a lot of planning involved there. So I have to make sure that plants for like three weeks from now are going to be ready for, for, for me to do my experiments in two weeks. Um, after that, I'll then go to my desk. I'll check my emails. I will then um, respond to what needs to be responded to. Um, and then the rest of my day kind of depends on, it kind of revolves around data, essentially. Um, it would depend on whether or not I'm collecting data. So I'll be either taking those plants and grinding them up, collecting DNA, to then do experiments with them, um, doing DNA sequencing, or I'll be analyzing the data. So once I've done the DNA sequencing, I'll be on the computer and I'll essentially be using, um, we have a, a lot of computer resources here where we do data analysis. Um, some, uh, our lab specifically uses a supercomputer down in Texas um, because we use a lot of, of uh, DNA sequencing. It's like terabytes of data. Um, so I'll be spending a lot of time on the computer, um, or I'll be writing up that data into manuscripts to try and get published to uh, basically show the rest of the world what it is I've, I've shown with my, my um, experiments. Yeah. Cool. So again, I'm getting a bit less computational and more lab work. I work in breast cancer, so every day is different in the lab. And even sometimes when you plan very well, things change because cells may be dying sooner than you thought. So usually what I do is I arrive and immediately they have to check my cells quickly under the microscope, see how they are doing. If they have grown a lot, it's moment to do the downstream analysis. Often we also need to feed them, so I feed them some new media so that they keep on growing. Then, for example, if they are ready, I'll take them and go to microscopy like some of you did today, and I look for the GFP protein, like you said you before, what it is, um, which cells grew more, is the ones in red or the ones in green. Then usually around lunchtime, we have a lot of seminars very often, so we may come here and listen to an amazing talk or some, from some scientist from another place in the world. Many things I'm doing now as well. Lunch is an amazing moment to be outside in the courtyard. I know today is not the best day for you to sit, but I'm still in class, and we, could, we can sit there in those benches and talk with other colleagues, meet uh, one another and have lunch together. Always then we meet a coffee usually to keep on pushing for the afternoon, so we'll go to a coffee cart. And then in the afternoon, very often, I'll go to another course of activity, the flow cytometry, and I think that many of you have heard about it. And it's a machine that can separate the cells based on colors as well, so then I can take those cells and do further experiments, put them again in place, and see how they are growing. And then some days, if I can leave a bit early, I'll go to do some of the hobbies, like uh, playing some sports or meeting some friends, going to trivia. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. A normal day is like this, more or less. All right, so I work a hybrid work from home on campus schedule and when I, I my office is based in, um, we have a separate campus called Salk North. Um, so my day starts with checking my email with coffee um, and generally my work can be separated into three different categories. Like first is meetings with scientists, um, second would be like research and then third would be like the making of whatever art, you know, illustration project um, I'm working on. And so I'll check my meeting schedule and work around any meetings with scientists I have. And those meetings can, um, they're really fun because each day is different. And part of my job is being able to switch from, switch my mindset from like plant science in one hour and then the next hour is something I'm talking about like, you know, neuroscience. Um, so it can get a bit dizzying sometimes, but it's really cool. It's, it's just really fascinating to be able to hear about these like novel research that's going on straight from the source. Um, so my meetings these days are largely on Zoom, but I'm trying to make more of an effort to come out to main campus and actually meet face to face with scientists because it does make a difference. Um, and then, you know, I will research, like read papers or like look up maybe how other science illustrators have illustrated a certain concept. And then, um, you know, the rest of my day is spent um, actually drawing. Um, I use a couple different programs. In my illustration work these days, I mostly use an iPad, and I use a program called Procreate, and I do a lot of drawing in there. Um, just as an example, uh, Salk has a magazine called Inside Salk, and this is a cover, I think this is our most recent issue. That, uh, this is a cover I've drawn, um, and it's showing like a kind of neuron landscape with these people um, and it's trying to show that like um, the importance of human connection and the kind of 
this, this metaphorical space of inside the brain, you know, that like human to human connection is so important. Um, yeah, that's, that's my day. Great, thank you. So what I wanna know now is, we heard what you wanted to be when you were 17, and we know what you do now. So how did you get there? How did you get from wanting to be an accountant to working in plant biology, James? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, are we talking specifically where I am now and like overarching? Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. Um, so when I was uh, in high school, I um, really started getting involved in um, classes in genetics. So I was really interested in how genes are turned on and off. Um, and basically like this whole idea of DNA, RNA, and how DNA makes RNA, makes protein. This is really quite a fascinating, what's going on behind me? <laughs> um, really, really fascinating me this whole sort of DNA thing. And then at the same time, I, um, my, my biology teacher who was teaching me things um, ran a gardening club. And um, so I attended a uh, gardening club because I was like, well, I want to do some extra hobbies, get out, get out outside. I mean, it is the UK, so it rains quite a lot, but you can still do gardening. And um, so once a week, we'd go out working on these plants. Now, I'm not actually very good at looking after plants, um, <laughs> even though I work on them. I'm quite a disorganized scientist, um, and being able to routinely water plants at home, I'm not very good at it. But with Gardening Club, because it was a, ru a routine thing that was organized by other people, I really enjoyed working with them. I really enjoyed like seeing the plants grow and seeing them develop. Um, and so it was really this passion from my high school teacher that sort of drew me towards plant biology. Um, so then when I was at university, I went off, obviously went off to doing biology. Um, I actually had to take a year out um, before going to university because I didn't have enough sciences. So I actually um, had chosen my A-levels we do in the UK before, before you go to university. And I've chosen history, religious studies, biology, and food technology. Um, but for quite a lot of universities, you need more than one science to be able to apply. So I actually had to take an extra year to take chemistry before going off to, to university. Um, so that was kind of an inter interesting sort of like thing where I was like, okay, I really want to do biology, but I'm willing to take this extra year and like basically a gap year, did other things, went to visit places, visit friends at their universities. Um, anyway, went off to university. Uh, then um, there was an opportunity to go to the plant summer, I called it plant camp, basically. It was a plant summer school that was run um, between all the universities in England, where basically all of these university students got together um, and spent a few weeks working, uh, understanding what um, plant science happened at the various universities from researchers, kind of what I'm doing now. And so that kind of really drew me towards plant biology um, and wanted to do a PhD in it. So then did a PhD in plant biology in, um, in Norwich, in the John Innes Center. Um, and then I had to decide, did I want to carry on in science? Did I want to find an uh, industry job? What sort of thing did I want to do? Really enjoyed doing the science. Really wanted to, had a few extra questions about my project that I really wanted to find out about. Um, and so we started looking at different labs across the world um, and found Joe, Joe Ecker, um, who does single cell um, sequencing biology and um, basically sent an email and was like, hey, these are the things I've done before. Um, are you interested in taking me on as a person in your lab? I'm really interested in doing these things with you. Um, and um, the first time he replied, he was really excited. We then met at a conference in Germany, um, had a great conversation. Then I sent another email, had like an automatic response back that um, basically he was like away. Um, he never got back to me. And then like a few months later, I sent another email and he was like, oh yeah, sorry, I completely forgot. Um, <laughs> which, which I think is quite a common thing with scientists. Um, and uh, then he was like, yeah, come across. So um, I did my interview on Skype, on um, Zoom, because it was during COVID. So I'd never actually visited California before moving across. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what brought me here, was the, 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 the lab work um, that I wanted to do. So yeah. Great, thank you. What about you, Carol? So I, as I told you, I studied biotechnology in Barcelona. And then in my third year, so the um, junior year, right, for you, there was the possibility to do an exchange. And one of the universities, I could do an exchange with all the UCs and little I knew at that moment. Uh, so I had this list of 10 UCs, I think. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I talked to, to my teachers and, and professors at university. What would you recommend? And I ended up going to UC Santa Cruz. So also first time in California, didn't know anything. Cell phones were not a thing yet, uh, 10 years ago. And I printed a map of how to arrive from the airport of SFO to Santa Cruz campus. And I managed with two luggages. And then that year was, was really important for me, I think, because um, something maybe different between Spain and here is that very quickly here you can get into internships and to lab work immediately while you are in college. 
So I took some classes and the teachers told me, oh, if you, uh, the professors told me, if you want to join our, our lab, you can do some experiments. And that's when I realized, oh, actually, I really like to be in the lab, do these experiments, have this freedom of have a question and try to answer it with the tools that we have. And have these lab meetings, these uh, weekly meetings in which we meet with our colleagues and we discuss like, oh, I had this idea, how should I do it? I have these results, what do you think? So then I went back to Spain to finish my major, um, joined another lab as well there. And I was very interested at the beginning more in more biotechnology, like biosensors and bioreactors and all of this. And then typically in Europe, uh, after the, the, uh, the undergrad, you do a master. So I looked for an engineering school that would do a bit of bio, but the core was engineering. And I got also a fellowship, so I could go to, the uh, to Zurich, the ETH, uh, Zurich in Switzerland. So I, I changed countries. Also, I've never been in Zurich, but uh, there there's an amazing public system uh, in place, so it was very easy to move around and quickly got to know that a small city. And I spent there my master. During my master, there was a lot of internships. So again, for me, similarly, the internships is what showed me that's what I want to do, you know? And it's the moment that you just don't study a concept, but apply it and you understand it and you use it and and see how the different quest, uh, research questions evolve over time. And then there I started working with a field that is called tissue engineering, and it's the idea to um, recreate the tissue outside in, in petri dishes in a way, and we worked a lot in recreating these tissues in 3D. So not growing them in a plate that it's kind of fake, but more giving the shape that all the organs and tissues have in our body. I love this, so I stayed there for a PhD, uh, so at the end, I spent a long time in Switzerland, and after skiing, falling in the snow, and all these things, I needed sun. So it wasn't random that I finished in San Diego. Uh, as well, of course, it motivates me that there's, um, there are a lot of great researchers all together in this area. And after looking a lot, a lot, a lot, I found the lab where am I now, uh, called Jeffrey Wall. Uh, he's pioneered in understanding breast cancer and the onset of cancer. And during my tissue engineering time, I had developed a lot of bone models and breast cancer often metastasized to bone. So you see that it's, it's changing a lot, but there's kind of a bit of a connection and I just wanted to know more about breast cancer. So, so here I am. And the last thing I want to see, uh, say, and it's reinforcing as well what Jimmy was saying, is to reach out and contact and send emails. Of course, I send emails that I never heard a response back from amazing labs that I would have loved to join. Sometimes you have to send reminders because everybody's very busy and it's not that they don't want to reply, but they just forgot. But be, be persuasive and, and when you get the response and then the same, I had a Zoom call, work out very well and I felt like that's the lab I want to go. And sometimes maybe the research is very different than what you expected, but if the environment is good as well, motivates you to work and you can learn much better than another lab that maybe initially you thought would be great. All right, um, so like I mentioned in high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but um, science was my best subject and I've been drawing all my life. Art has just been kind of like my main hobby for, for ever since I was a kid. Um, so in undergrad, um, I was really noticing, you know, when I was studying, how much art actually was involved in my own studying process. Like for example, when I took human anatomy, I like drew the bones to help me remember the names of all of them. And I would draw out, you know, like the cell pathways and stuff to really, you know, try to get that in my brain. Um, and it's, I started to wonder if there was like a career, like combining science and art, um, which just were like the two of my strongest, um, just, you know, talents. Um, and I, I, I Googled it. I just, I went on Google and was like, what do I do with these two um, fields? And it turns out there's absolutely a place for that. Um, so after I graduated undergrad, I really thought it was important. I wanted to like get out into the world. You know, I'd grown up in California, went to school in California. Um, I wanted to push myself to go to a different country and, and just like, see what I was capable of, you know, prove to myself that I was capable of, like, going out there. Um, so that's when I taught, uh, was an assistant English teacher in Japan for two years, and I lived in this little countryside town where there was no trains, and I didn't have a car, and so I biked everywhere, and um, it was absolutely amazing two years. And, like, on paper, contributed very little to my career. It really didn't have much to do, but in actuality, like, 
the education aspect of that experience was really helpful. Like, you know, I got a view of the other side of the classroom and got to see like what helps students like learn um, and how, let's say, visuals can help students learn. Um, I developed any sort of public speaking skills I have, I developed during that time. Um, so it's, it was just an incredible experience and it's something I'm really passionate about telling kids is that like, it doesn't have to be the straightforward path. Like any experience you have will, will benefit you in some way. Um, so during those two years in Japan, I worked on my art portfolio to get into grad school. Um, and I applied, was waitlisted, and then got accepted to the University of Toronto's medical illustration program. And I spent two years there and just had an absolutely amazing time. Um, and then came to Salk. And um, I've been working here for about three years, I think maybe a little over three years now. Um, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a dream job. Thank you, Amy. I have one more question for you before we open it up to the audience. And that question is, how has your identity or culture impacted your career path? I go first to start. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think that what I had is a lot of support from my family. So I, I'm the first generation that, that went to university. As you may know, Spain was in a dictatorship until 1975. So all the childhood of my parents was very, very different. But they had clear, uh, all my previous generations, the value of getting an education. So they really always pushed me to, to, to do my homework and to study, and then also supported me a lot on which career to choose. It is true that my, parent, my father had the idea of more economy because thought it would be a better job down the line than not science, what could be my job after. They didn't know. But they always supported me, and I think this, this was very nice also when I decided to, to move around and travel. They helped me look for fellowships. They, they talked to friends that could help us find fellowships and opportunities to, to now be able to be here. And yeah, it is true that it's also been hard to be far away from them, especially now. It's nine hours difference. So sometimes during lunchtime, that it's the night in Spain, I try to call them and be a bit closer. Uh, none of my family left. Uh, my, my brother uh, also went to university in my hometown, did a PhD in my hometown, and is living three streets from my parents. So sometimes I do, I am jealous of that life, to, to have that community all the time, but then I love what I do here, and having met so many different people and having learned so much, so it's always a, a balance, and, and of course there's good days and bad days always. But yeah, the support. All right. Um, so my background, I'm Chinese American, and my parents moved here from China, and I was born here. Um, they both have degrees. My dad has a PhD from Irvine. Um, my, my mom worked as an accountant, and she has a master's. Um, but as a child of immigrants, um, my parents had a very like survive, not thrive mindset about careers, and I, I, assume, I think that's something a lot of children of immigrants can relate to. Um, growing up, my parents were very focused on like what's practical for a career, like what makes sense. Um, they wanted me to be an accountant, which I find <laughs> is funny, because <laughs> I was like, whose dream job is an accountant? They exist. Um, but they wanted for me something stable, um, something low stress, and we had a lot of cultural differences about what a career is in your own life. Um, I wanted to find something meaningful, something that makes use of of what I'm good at, and I knew I was good at art. Um, but, you know, it was very hard for them to see art as any sort of viable career path. Um, so I had a lot of difficulty uh, just kind of getting to where I am on the personal, like, parent side front. We had a lot of uh, conflict about, you know, like, my own life decisions. Um, it all worked out, you know. They're just very happy I'm not like a homeless artist on the street. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how my cultural background played in. Um, and you know, it's, it's tough because at the end of the day, they just wanted to make sure you know, I was safe and they wanted you know, a good future for me. Mm -hmm. But the, just the mindsets of what that future looks like is very different and I just kind of attribute it to my own hidden stubbornness that I kind of 
bullied my way through and was like, I, you know, I know you guys are worried, but I'm going to do this anyway. And that's how I got to where I am. Okay, um, I would kind of say there would be three kind of points that kind of relate to what the other two were talking about. The first one coming from my family background. So um, my two older brothers were the first in our family to go off to university. Um, I then obviously went off to university as well. Um, however, my family isn't like a scientific background. Um, my, my mum doesn't really care anything about my wallet as I do with biology. So my parents have always just been supportive generally as, well, as long as I'm happy. Um, however, coming from like, that background, a public school, um, so I applied to Oxford University twice actually. Um, didn't get in both times. Um, and actually, I felt like that particular experience helped with my um, identity today. Partly because um, when I went off and eventually did my PhD in science, I met people who had been to Oxford University and Cambridge University. And they hadn't had necessarily the same experiences as me in terms of like failure, in terms of things that hadn't worked out and things of resilience. And so when it came to doing science, came to doing experiments and during the PhD, um, it, was, it was quite interesting to see, and I, I obviously supported them, but it was interesting to see that the people who had gone to Oxford and Cambridge often struggled to deal with the less structured system that the um, PhD comes with in terms of you don't get the, the validation of, of like a good mark. You don't get, if, you, if something fails for months on end. Um, and so actually I feel like those experiences that I had growing up, um, coming from the background I did, helped me quite a lot in terms of being who I am, being the resilient person I am, and enjoying what it is I do at the same time. Um, secondly, being English. Um, surprisingly, <laughs> um, contributed quite a lot to my identity here in California, I've noticed. Um, there's <laughs> conversations I have every day about my, my English culture compared to, to American culture, um, but also being in an international setup. Um, like the way that I do science is very, that, I, that English people do science, I would say is, is different than the way that California people do, uh, American people do science. Um, and so it's been very interesting sort of like coming from that background, being able to sort of like teach ways that I do things to other people in the lab who come from all over the world and then them teaching me how to do mm -hmm. things. Um, yeah. Um, and then the third point um, I kind of wanted to bring up was so I identify as gay. Um, and uh, that hasn't so much featured as much in, in terms of my career, in terms of science. However, it did feature, for example, when I did my PhD. So uh, in a PhD, you often have a direct supervisor um, and you um, are going to be working very closely with this person. You're going to be working on a project together with this person for, in the UK, it's four years. In America, it's a bit longer. Um, <laughs> so, um, when, as I was going into my PhD, I was about 20, 20, 21 years old. I wanted to establish that this person I was going to have a close relationship, a close professional relationship with, was also going to be supportive of me as a person because this is going to be four years of my life. I'm going to be living here in this completely new city. Um, and so I remember when I interviewed with, with um, her, she's a very amazing scientist named Xiao Qi Feng. Um, she's from, originally from China. Um, and I asked her, I was like, okay, what's your opinion on LGBT rights? What's your opinion on all of these things? Um, because I wanted to establish that this was going to be a, a, like a, a, a nice a, a, a healthy environment, a supportive environment, because that matters, because you're going to be here for your life. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, in that way, I think it did kind of feature in my career, because um, it, you want to be in an environment where, where, where like those sort of rights are supportive. And so that has featured mostly also in terms of like the John Innes Center where I did my PhD generally, there were quite a lot of things going on. Um, the Salk Institute, there's quite a lot of um, support. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, societies that support um, black rights, LGBT rights, women's rights. And so I think that sort of thing is important in, in terms of um, my identity and my culture. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your background. We really appreciate that. Um, so we have some questions coming in from the audience um, through Mentimeter, but if you also want to ask it, feel free to raise your hand and Shoshana will run a mic to you. Um, so there's a couple of questions coming in. The first is Amy, are you the only science illustrator at Salk? I am, yes. <laughs> um, there's one science illustrator position and it was started by the previous illustrator here. And the history is that he was a scientist who decided he was a better artist than scientist. <laughs> and he really kind of made this position and has this legacy here. Um, and he, in 2019, uh, was retiring. And so I uh, managed to get the job. But yes, the answer is one. Great. One and only. James, what kind of plants are you currently working with? Uh, so I currently work on a plant called Marcantia. 
Um, I don't know if you saw my slide where I sort of spot it in the wilderness. Um, so <laughs> um, it's a basically a, a moss-like species. Um, it's a, I study it because I'm interested in evolutionary biology. So most people in plant biology work on um, a plant called Arabidopsis. It's a plant that flowers. It's kind of like a weed, but it will grow in cracks of, of pavements, or as you call it, sidewalks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'm interested in how um, things are different between different plant species and how they're the same and what that means in terms of their development. So during my PhD, I really started working on this plant, Moscantia. Like I said, it's kind of like a moss. It doesn't grow very tall. Um, it really likes wet conditions. So like here in, in San Diego, it's not very common, but like if you go find some, some creeks or, or some rivers, you'll find that it'll be there growing. Um, and uh, quite often people in the lab, even plant biologists will go up to me and, and see this plant and they'll be like, oh, that's such an interesting mutant for Arabidopsis, <laughs> thinking that it's, it's just a weird looking plant that they, they typically work on. And I'm like, no, it's completely different. Um, yeah, so that's why I work on. I specifically work on sperm development. Um, so uh, as you may know, flowering plants produce pollen, um, but Marcantia and moss, they actually produce swimming sperm. So they produce sperm with two, uh, two tails and that allows them to swim to fertilize the egg. So anytime, I, I, I like telling this joke to people, especially in the UK where it rains a lot, if you're walking through the woods and you're like walking through some moss and it's rained recently, chances are you're walking through some plant sperm. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Does anyone have a question from the audience that you have not put on Mentimeter? <laughs> oh, we have one in the back. Um, Ms. Cross? Um, I was wondering what types of things do you enjoy most about, about biotech and if there's any new projects you're starting or helping with right now? Yes, so the first question is biotech, right? So maybe more my undergrad. I like biotech because it had the same kind of uh, program than biology and a bit more towards the engineering. And already during high school, I liked a lot physics, chemistry. So that's why I chose biotechnology and not biology. And as well, Jim is a passionate of plants, I'm a bit less. So then I thought, OK, biotechnology was more human focus. Um, yes, yeah, so that's on the first question. Then the second on the projects that I'm working now. So yes, we always have new projects. Basically, you do an experiment, and you see the outcome, and you have a new question and a new experiment. So now what we're seeing is, for example, very specific that a type of um, so the, the, the memory gland, the, the breast, basically has like this duct, so it's a structure like this. The middle is hollow because it's where the cells will put the milk, potentially, and then all of this is full of cells. When there is cancer, these cells start growing inside, and we're trying to see why and who are these cells. So we have them labeled and we see. And we're starting to see that some of these cells, we, we started to have a suspect because it's kind of a subtype inside a type of cells that it's growing there in these specific breast tumors that we're looking. Um, this is for Amy. I, I know we like have all these visuals around us about science and you mentioned your research and you mentioned talking to other scientists and you mentioned like your personal research. I just want to know how much is your research like actual hands on with what you're trying to visualize? Like, are you also in a lab or is it mainly just like talking to the scientists who work with what you draw? That's a great question. And the answer is I am much more hands off than I would like to be. Um, you know, what's really funny is I've today saw an organoid for the first time in a lab. We went, I was with the group that went to Christy Tower's lab and so I've, or, I've illustrated so many organoids, um, but this is the first time I actually got to see one. Um, so much of my work, um, I think especially, you know, because of the pandemic, but it's like Zoom meetings and scientists kind of drawing out um, concepts of their research, and I am not really in the labs, but I think that's something I'd really like to change moving forward, because there's, there's just so much so much usefulness that comes from being in the space and seeing exactly what they're doing. Great, we have had this question come in in a couple of different ways, so I wanted to ask it um, for James and Carl. Since you both did your degrees outside of the US, how has that affected how you do your science now in your labs? Has there been a learning curve, an adjustment period, or is science conducted very differently? 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know how, should I, how do I describe this? Part of it, it's on two levels, partly because I came from doing a PhD to now doing a postdoc. So at a PhD level, you're working under the umbrella of a supervisor who is working very closely with you. And I, when I came to do the, the postdoc here, I kind of wanted a bit more of a hands-off supervisor where I could then develop my own independent research and my own, um, my own passions, my, the things that I wanted to do on my own. Um, and so it's been interesting to go from having that safety net to still having a safety net, but it's a lot lower. Uh, so um, that's been kind of a, an interesting experience to them being like, okay, no, I, if I push forward with something, it's because I believe it's true rather than because I still check with like my colleagues and things, but now I'm, I'm like, uh, yes, I definitely believe this. That probably comes from the experience I now have. Um, in terms of English versus American science, we've sort of asking that in terms of um, how things are done. I, I heard things before I came here in terms of, because my, my, my PhD supervisor had also studied at Berkeley. She did her, her postdoc here in California. And um, the explanation, the, the sort of stories I'd heard was that in America, things weren't necessarily discussed as much. So in lab meetings, um, like uh, problems with experiments weren't necessarily like highlighted. It was much more of a sort of like, here is the data I've produced and here's the interesting story and less of a discussion. Whereas in the UK, there, there were a lot more discussions about this, this, this experiment isn't working. Is there any advice that you can give me? Um, and I think that is true to an extent. The, the lab meetings I have here are, do you follow that more of that trend of saying, not talking about the issues? But those issues are discussed more in the lab setting as in like in the day-to-day -day life of, mm -hmm. of the lab. Um, so that was an interesting transition for me because I was still presenting my lab meetings as if I was saying like, this thing has com gone completely wrong, my plants are dying. And then everyone was like, sad times. <laughs> but, but then like after the lab meeting, people would come up to me and say like, oh, have you tried doing this and that? So um, yeah, uh, but, but that's also kind of an, it, an interesting experience to have had because now when it comes to me presenting my work to world scientists, I have taken on a bit more on board about being more sort of like presenting my work as like, this is, this is the story I wanted to tell. And then the, the, the problems I've had, although they matter, they, they're, they're not necessarily the important thing I want to tell because I'm trying to explain this interesting scientific discovery I've made, not the fact that I've managed to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, I really, really agree with all your points and good. I felt the same. Uh, I think in general, my experience was in Switzerland, but I think it's maybe more all over Europe. We are a bit shyer with our data. Here, I think you guys are very eloquent. You talk very well and always express very well. Maybe that's also a language barrier that I don't know if you felt it since English is also your mother tongue. Um, yeah, the lab meetings point that you make, it's true, but I think also it depends a lot on the labs that you go, the institutions that you go, you know, my exp I, I did also an exchange in Boston during my master in MIT Harvard in a lab and was very different than my current lab here. So I think every lab is also run with a different philosophy. So make sure that when you are getting there, if you can do an internship and you test it a bit for a few weeks, if you like it or not, or just meeting people, you know, asking the people that are working there, like, hey, how is the relationship between you, you know? There's labs that it's very linear. There's labs that there's more uh, kind of a hierarchy. Uh, so this, I think it really depends on the, on the lab and not so much on the country in general. And I think I, I would sort of say from that that it's important, well, well, it was important for me when I came to, came to join Joe's lab that I wasn't shy about asking what the, the atmosphere, what the, mm -hmm. the, um, the way of the lab was, was because it's, this applies to any sort of like setup of like people working together, that there are going to be different cultures, different ways of working. And like, you can be shy and be like, oh, well, I don't want to ask the, the hard questions of being like, okay, well, is there anything weird going on in the lab? How do, how do they handle publications? How do they handle authorship? Things like that. No. But you should feel free to ask those questions because this is where you're going to be spending your time mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. This is where your career is going to be built. So, yeah. yeah, and the environment and the support you get from your mentors or the senior people in the lab is really crucial to your success. So make sure you see they are ready to help you. And also maybe to add as last thing, every PI also comes from very different nationalities. So even if we're in the US, it's so diverse that um, that's why also every lab is very different, I think. Great, thank you. I've got a question. Um, we've heard a lot about what you guys do at Salk, but what do you guys like to do in your free time? So what do you like to do outside of work? What do you like to do in San Diego versus different countries? 
Am I yeah. this? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, um, as much as I did want to come join Joe's lab, one of the main thing, one of the main reasons for me wanting to come to California, because it is quite far from England, I am obviously away from family, was because I wanted to travel. Uh, so, so um, I didn't know how to drive in England, um, so I had to learn to drive here because California is big. <laughs> um, so I finally learned to drive in July, got the car in September, and ever since then I've just been driving everywhere. I've been um, going around. I went to Julian, um, got, saw the apple tr trees and everything. Um, I've been to uh, LA a couple of times. I basically got a long list of places I want to go to. I've been to uh, Monterey on the, up, up uh, near San Francisco and San Francisco. Um, I really want to go to Grand Canyon, all of these other places. That's essentially what I like to do <laughs> in my spare time. Yeah, for me too, road tripping for sure. I, it's incredible that it's a lot of driving, but it's kind of easier to drive here, I feel, than in Europe. I don't know, it's more normal as well to five hours on a Friday afternoon to reach a national park. Um, yeah, also Vegas. Vegas is a unique place that I would have never <laughs> thought it really exists, like a theme park for adults. Uh, <laughs> I still haven't done surfing because I have too much respect of the waves. I thought I would, like San Diego, I had to surf. But the Mediterranean is a very calm sea. So now suddenly when I see these waves and the temperature of the water, um, I play paddle, which is a Spanish, uh, a Spanish or a static kind of in Spain, Mexico. But it's also here, also a great place to create a community. So yeah, for sure the hobbies help a lot also to create a community. Because here, of course, we work, but it's work as well. You have your colleagues that more, very often you'll become friends because you spend a lot of time. But also other ways to find community. And yeah, I think that's my main hobbies. So the I draw for work, and my main hobby outside of drawing for work is drawing for fun. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I draw a lot of like original art and like fan art for fun. Um, and you know, it's great for my work too because just that love of art keeps me learning and keeps me getting better like all the time. Otherwise, I'm getting into hiking because drawing is a very sedentary. <laughs> um, practice and that's not great for long term. So getting into hiking and really, really having fun with that. Um, I love travel as well and haven't done it much recently, but um, I'm really excited to just travel around California and keep hiking in new places. Great. We have a couple of people wondering what is the favorite part of your job and what is the least favorite part of your job? And anyone can answer that question. My favorite part is um, when I see that an experiment has worked, of course, right? But uh, kind of when you see something like, oh, wow, like either it was as you expected or it wasn't, but you have a clear result. And I know it seems obvious, but very often we get results that are a bit confounding, so you don't really know. What I like less, for example, is that sometimes I need to spend hours imaging in the microscope something that, okay, I need to image it, but I'm not learning anything. It's just routinary to image and see how cells are growing. But I already know the results, so it's just kind of validating it to either publish it or show it to my group. And this sometimes it's true that it's many hours doing the same, so it can get boring. But yeah, when you see that thing you were expecting or not expecting, clearly it's cool. Yeah, I would kind of be in the same brain. So. Um, my favorite part of the, the, the job is when I see something weird in the data. And like back when I, in, in my um, PhD, so um, my supervisor, Xiao Chi Feng, um, our, our lab was basically half Chinese, half, half English. Um, and it, it, it happened with both the English colleagues and my Chinese colleagues where like, I would be like, oh, that's really weird. And like half my colleagues would be like, oh no, that means it's bad. And what, what I meant was that it was weird as in it was different and strange from what like, I expected. And I really enjoyed that sort of feeling of being like, oh, this is a really strange result. What's, what, what's explaining it? And then explaining it to people and then being like, oh, okay, look, look, there's this really cool thing I've seen. Like, what do you think it means? And like saying, this is what I think it means and having that discussion. Um, so that's really exciting. And at the moment, I have a colleague, Renee, who sits right next to me. And she has to put up with me every day, like sitting at my computer, just being like, oh, look, I found this cool thing. Look, look at this. Um, and she's really patient with me. It's great. Uh, <laughs> um, the thing I hate most um, is probably, again, some of the repetitive tasks that you have to do. like. Um, I'm, like I've said before, I'm not very good at growing plants, and um, for like the last six months or so, I've had problems with growing the plant I work on. Um, it's interesting to troubleshoot, but then when like it's an extended period of things not going well, you're, you, it is frustrating. You're there, like going like, 
I need this to work. Um, but then, as I've said before, you have that resilience, you have people to help you, you have these things to, um, systems in place to navigate that. <coughs> So I have two favorite parts of my job, and the first is like when I make something and the scientist says like, oh, you know, this is this is great, this is awesome, this is exactly what I was looking for. I couldn't have made this on my own, and it's just it's really great to feel helpful and and feel that like yeah, you know, you sh it's not your job to make this level of like figure, graphic, or illustration, and just like that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you be able to visualize your scientists for whatever audience, you know, whether it's like students or other scientists, you know, whatever for your conference, um, for your presentation, to be able to help them communicate um, and to save them time, you know, like they don't have to go learn the ins and outs of Adobe Illustrator, like that's what I'm here to help them with. Um, the second favorite part of my job is the more artsy parts. Um, for example, the magazine, I get to kind of pull out some of the, those art chops that I don't, wouldn't necessarily put into a scientific figure, and I get to have a lot of fun experimenting with artistic techniques. And so the variety of what I do is, is really satisfying. Um, the part I dislike most is um, sometimes I, you know, will have a project with a scientist and they don't really know what they want. This is not a bad thing. It can be a really great challenge for us to work together to work towards figuring out what they want. But it, I find it stressful because, you know, I, it's, I, I want to make something good for them. And, and sometimes I'm, I have this pile of their research and I, and I just kind of do my best to digest it and all this complicated stuff and try to figure out what they want, but I'm not a mind reader. And I just kind of do the best with, you know, um, what I have. And, and it's always worked out. And, you know, just sometimes I get a little convinced, like, this is the one time it's not going to work out. And, um, but that, that can be a really challenging process when they don't know what they want. Um, this is a question for Amy. And I would just wanted to ask, like, what type of fandoms do you draw for? <laughs> what type of fandoms do I draw for? I draw a lot of anime fan art. Um, Jujutsu Kaisen, My Hero Academia, that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. Any questions in the audience? Okay, I see one right over here. Hi, um, this is for all of you guys, but um, so how much time do you spend research, researching and how much do you spend like outside or does the times fluctuate? The ta uh, how so, much time do we spend in the lab, right? Yeah, how much time do you spend in the lab usually? And then how much time can you spend outside of the lab working on other projects? It fluctuates a lot. Um, there are days that it's not an exaggeration, they may be 16 hours, 18 hours. Very often you may have a colleague that can help, you know, and one starts early, the other takes over. But you know, when you're working with cells or, or um, experiments that are long and they are precious, you need to keep on, you know, you cannot leave it at any moment, you cannot just put it in the fridge and the day after it's not going to be good. But we are very flexible, so it's true that if one day you've, or the majority of us are very flexible, if one day you work 16 hours, the day after you can take it easier. Maybe you can come in late or you can leave early. So yeah, I think there's a lot of flexibility as well. If one Friday you want to take off, you take it off because it is well known that usually we don't work nine to five. And this is a good question to ask to the lab you want to join to know how is this environment and, and yeah. Yeah, I, I'd agree. It depends on the situation, depends on the lab, depends on the person. Um, so, like, uh, I know people in my lab who shift their, their day so that they come in later, they leave later because of traffic, um, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then, again, depending on if I've got plants that are ready to do an experiment, because obviously you want a certain stage of, of development, you're going to have to, if you, if you have to plan it so that, like, you know that on X date you are going to be doing that experiment. You're going to be in the lab for, for two days working on this. You can't do anything else because the plants won't wait for you. They will be too, too old. Um, so um, uh, things like that. But then there are days where like, I've spent time just reading papers and not really. Like, you can go like, a couple of days thinking, I've not actually done anything towards my own 
research. I've just spent time researching other people's stuff, learning other people's stuff. So that's part of the job. Um, <laughs> because you, you, learning what was happening outside of there then informs what you do. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, there, are, there are different ways of, of, of spending your day that sometimes feel like you're, you're not doing the thing you should be doing. MI is sometimes quite challenging to, to, to deal with. But generally speaking, if you're, you're, you're doing science, you're, you will be doing something. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a weird way of saying it, but you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> um, as long as you're, you're doing something that you're passionate about, you're doing something where you're like, okay, even, even if there are days where I'm like, okay, I'm having a really slow day, I'm sat at my computer, and like, I have to do this analysis, and I'm just sat there, and I'm like, I can only give 20% today. I, I, this is something I've been telling myself for the last year, where like, if I'm giving 20% of my day, but I like, feel like I can only give 20% of my day, that's still me giving 100% of my 20%, if that makes sense. <laughs> that's kind of how I see it. Um, so, yeah. Science. <laughs> and you can make it work also nine to five. I also don't want to scare you completely <laughs> because it really depends on which type of research you do and, and as well in your personal preferences. I had amazing colleagues that really stick nine to five, had kids very early and they were every day to go pick up their kids at five. So also to not scare you completely. <laughs> Everything can work in science. Thanks for sharing. We have one final question which came in a couple of different ways. Knowing where you, where you are now in your career, what would you go back and tell yourself at this age, 17 years old, um, that would, any resources, programs, knowledge that you think would be helpful to these students? So, <laughs> um, having done the things I did, I don't want to make it sound like I've done the, the, the correct route, because I very much feel like I could have ended up how, where I am, having done it a few different ways. Um, however, like the summer internship I did, I then spent, did a year in industry down in the Botanic Gardens at Kew Gardens in London. Um, those sort of things where like, those experiences then, then informed kind of what it is I liked, what I didn't like. Um, I kind of had the opportunity to go off into industry and decided actually I kind of wanted to do more plant basic research. Um, so like, but having those, sort of looking out for those opportunities that are sort of like sent in emails that might be sent from like um, various institutes, things on looking online saying like, oh, can I get an experience doing this certain activity? Like I think um, it might be even talked about that there, there's um, a summer internship at Salk. Um, so uh, basically finding out those opportunities or like trying out a few things, um, seeing, seeing what you like, seeing what you don't like, um, emailing people. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, you're all very welcome to email me. You're, uh, very likely able to email education outreach. Um, these, these, these emails often feel, um, uh, what's the word, uh, daunting. Um, and I have supervised people before who, who refuse to send me email and I'm like, just send it, just send it and I'll, I'll, I'll draft it for you, send it. And then they get a reply like next day saying exactly what it is they want to hear, like, yes, I'll help you. Because scientists, people want to help you. <laughs> um, they might be really busy and they might not respond immediately, but like people are excited when you're asking them questions that they can help you with. And if they can't help you, they'll often, I'll write an email to people, I'll say like, oh, if you don't know, do you think you could point me towards someone who does know? And often that'll be the case. They'll either say, and, and the worst case scenario is they won't reply or they'll say, sorry, I can't help you. Those are the two situations. Um, so yeah, those, work. Those, those would be the piece of advice I'd give to myself, I think. Yeah. Okay, Jimmy said it all. Sorry. So, no, no, no. Uh, so yeah, the same. Use your connections. Don't be shy. Email, you know, come to us. Uh, come to all your teachers, you know, because we may not be the person, but we know who to forward your email, you know, and really try and, and do what you most love, and eventually you'll get there. And try to not stress too much. I know taking this decision is, is a lot and everybody's asking you and, and you feel you don't know. The ones that you know, easy. The ones that you don't know, I, I know it's a lot, but you will see one way or another. And if you start something and you don't like it, you can always go back, really. One year in your life, even 10 years in your life, doesn't matter. And there's really ways, and at the end, I think it's the people who will help you to change, you know, or suddenly you will realize you have good people around you, so you love that thing that maybe initially you didn't. I think you guys said it all, but really, yeah, for me, I think it comes down to three things. And the first is try new things. And like you said, you can always quit. Like, you can always be like, that is not for me. And that's such useful information to have. Mm -hmm. I volunteered in a children's hospital, and I was like, oh, God, this is not for me. I volunteered in a research lab and was like, God, this is not for me. Um, and just kind of had so many, like, failures. And, you know, but, but at the end of the day, they were just such good learning experiences. 
Um, so just don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to try new things. And the second thing is to keep doing what you love and either it'll just be something you keep doing, you keep loving through your life or it could be, end up being really useful, you know? Um, just don't let go of like the things that make you happy, the things that you feel good at, the things that bring you joy. Um, and you just never know where, where like life will lead you. And the third is um, informational interviews. And like they were saying, like emails, you know, that type of thing. Um, but when I Googled about science illustration, I just cold emailed a bunch of random scientific illustrators. And a, most of them got back to me and were incredibly kind and let me just set up a time to ask them questions. And I was just some random under, like I had no connection to them whatsoever, but I just said, hey, I looked at your website. Your stuff is really cool, really interesting. Like, would you be willing to talk to me about your job and about your schooling? Um, and, and, you know, people are just really, they want to help. They want to, you know, be able to give advice and to answer your questions. Um, and I do, and I, and I feel that, like, you know, passion myself to, like, pass that on. And I get interview or I get um, emails from people once in a while um, asking me, you know, can I ask you some questions? Um, just don't be afraid. Like, people will be able to sense your genuine interest and will want to kind of reciprocate that. Great, thank you. So we didn't get a chance to get to all of our questions. So if you have a question that didn't get answered, send them an email, they'll answer it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you can reach them through our team, education at self.edu. We'll make sure that they get your email. And we're nearing the very end. We have two more minutes of instructions for you and Shoshana's gonna take over right now and let you know how we're going to be leaving. <laughs> 